Well, friendly hellos. Welcome to the first allocator call taking place on August 20th. Let's take a look. At this agenda, we've built the majority of the time to take a look at the data calf refresh process. The goal is to talk about what works well and what can be improved on to shorten the wait times for everybody involved. So we have some slides to kind of walk through what the current workflow is, discuss some of the proposals from the community. And then ideally, the folks on this call get your input on some of the timelines that are discussed and really just kind of align on what we're looking for. One of the smaller points is we had an issue with tooling. It was flagged in issue number 67. We'll check in on that and just kind of give you an update on where that stands as well as what information makes it a lot easier for the third-party developers to triage and fix things for you. So those will be the two main highlights. If there's anything else you'd like to discuss, as always, we save time at the end of the call for the discussion portion of it. So today is August 20th. This is the first call taking place at 1600 UTC. Next call takes place at 0200. And the next call will take place on September 3rd. If we look at last two weeks, metrics over metrics, we've seen that we have two, 12, 12 <laughs> new clients that came on board, which resulted in around 40 petabytes going out the door. And that was serviced by 54 of the current active allocators that are in the program. So let's dive into the data cap refresh process. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go very slowly through these next slides. And the slides are shared both in Slack as well as the chat for this call. So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot a hand up. And what we're really looking for is discussion on some of these posts. So really like your feedback as we go. So what I'd like to do is just kind of start with a high level orientation on what takes place from the governance team and the data cap refresh. So whenever we have a time, what we're looking at is lots of communication between several different parties, all working in different time zones. So as you know, if you're an allocator on this call, when you receive your application from clients and you've distributed the data cap that goes out, you're then waiting either for the Phil Watchdog account to self-review you, or you can submit your own, hey, here's all my metrics and try to improve that process. Then what happens is the community governance steps in where there and I were looking at these applications to say, hey, does this data cap that went out match exactly what this allocator said they would be doing? And if not, what are the differences in these applications and how do we rectify that information? So let's take a look at a finer scale of how that really works out. The main categories that we've kind of highlighted on past calls and what the Phil Watchdog has called out really fall into four parts. We're looking to verify that, hey, the retrievals are either at the metrics we want to see them or you're showing significant improval process in your retrieval. We could see the bookkeeping communications for every data cap that went out the door. We could three, see the SPs that were assigned were the ones that were used. And fourth, the distribution schedule closely mirrors a relationship of trust that's built out in the application. So at a very high level, these are the four points that we're looking for to verify behavior. So what does that verification look like and what results in delay? Here are four reasons why a data cap refresh application will either slow down, stall, or speed through the program. So the first off, as you could see, it's missing key information. So if a member of the communicator, an allocator, submits this application for a refresh, and they don't have a lot of detail, what that essentially does is it starts the issue off, but then now we're on the back end trying to find out, okay, what information needs to be added to this and has the Phil Watchdog account and community review already gone forward? The second is it doesn't match. So if we see retrieval rates in the diligence review that say, hey, I'm looking at like 60%, when we go back and we check pulse or some other metrics on the allocator registry, we could see it doesn't align. So then it's trying to figure out before we reach out for questions, we're doing more of like an investigative analysis to make sure that this lines up. That also slows down when we have multiple applications that are coming through at different times. The third will be not fully complete. So if an allocator submits a request for data cap refresh and say we're missing the distribution schedule or we can't find the bookkeeping paths, Again, it puts it more of like a back and forth where now we have to identify what data is missing, co coalesce that missing information that we need from the allocator 
and then send that back to the allocator, which can result in, again, delays and slowdowns. And then the fourth is getting the shortening time from when the final review has gone out for an application to receive its data cap refresh to getting all of the steps for the root key holders to sign and issue that data cap. So at a very high level, pulling back the curtain, if there is a delay or as we look to speed this up as a community, these are the four points that we should really address. And that's what we're gonna kind of dissect in the next portions of this call. So coming up, this is where I'd really like to hear any feedback or thoughts, feel free to use chat or just shoot a hand up as we go. So great proposal. This came in from ND Labs. ND Labs, thank you. Always looking at ways that we can improve this and drive forward. So I appreciate you taking the time to put this together. I'd like to really kind of dive into this. So if you haven't checked out issue 137, it's linked in the slides, it's linked in the allocator channel, and it's in the governance repo. And essentially what we're looking at with this proposal is how can we streamline this process to make it faster and more efficient? And then as we look to make it more efficient, what is a realistic SLA that we could hold each other accountable for for getting that data cap refresh? So as we look at these steps, the, the high level goal is two weeks from the time it opens to when the data cap goes out, which I think is very, very doable as long as we're just kind of aligning and making sure that we have some timelines set up. So let's take a look at what would cause that two week to come back. So issue number one in this proposal says, look, can we know what the roles and responsibilities are for some members that are doing this diligence? That's a great point. So before I make that issue and really flush it out, I wanted to respond and just really get the information flowing. So as far as a governance team, there's two members and that's Galen and myself. For those of you that have been around the program pre-nucleation back in 2024, 2023, 2022, the team was much larger with the protocol labs. So one of the reasons why we're trying to re-pivot this is just the realities of working in an environment where we went from having a much larger team to a much smaller team and how we're divvying that up. So the way that kind of works is Galen and myself provide that governance. A lot of the role that I provide is stewardship, helping making sure that the communications line up between you, anybody else between the root key holders, our developer teams, Fiddle, Galen, and bubbling that up so it's all set. Galen is the lead for the Phil Plus program, who oversees its development, who oversees its trajectory and roadmap. And he kind of serves as like the auditor to kind of look back at this information to QC it, kind of taking that fine tooth comb approach that I may take or the watchdog may take, and really looking at it as, is this allocator achieving their objectives that they set out? And is that objective aligned with the program? So Galen's giving more of that high level final checkoff before it goes out. You'll see that there's a Phil Watchdog account that posts in these issues as well. This is kind of self-led between the governance team, between the community, and what it's designed to do is ask questions that should be open and really put out there. That way it's not just coming from myself and Galen, but it's really opening that up for anybody who wants to ask questions on these. Galen, I see that your hand's up, so before I go on to RKH or anything else, I'll turn it over to you for any input you may have. Yeah, I just uh, I appreciate this proposal. Um, I appreciate also, you know, having these conversations. I think there's a question in the chat about, you know, when is this new allocator application going to get reviewed? Um, and I think these are two examples of like how these things are in direct competition for what we can prioritize. Um, if we focus on approving all of the new allocator applications that we have seen for ones that are um, similar manual diligence pathways, then we have less time to be doing these due diligence reviews on the existing ones, right? And then we have less time to focus on pooling. You know, if you look at the number of people that are on this team um, and the amount of work that's ahead of us, we have to pick and choose where we can kind of prioritize and, and invest this time. So as it stands, this is something we've been communicating. We are focusing mostly on novel allocator pathways. We worked with the Fiddle team to put out an RFA. Uh, we want to see more marketplace um, allocators. We know those take longer uh, to kind of spin up. We want to see more automated pathways. We know those take more tooling. But in the meantime, we have a lot of performant 
manual diligence pathways that are saying, we'll work with enterprise, we'll work with public open data, we'll work across different regions, we'll ask different diligence questions. You know, if a client is a good fit for one of those pathways, based on the number that there are and the spread of them, they're probably a good fit for a couple pathways. Um, and that's just why we have not been focusing our efforts right now on reviewing and approving new allocators that are doing similar manual diligence processes. Um, because exactly the reason that um, ND Labs is bringing up here in this issue number 137, it takes a long time for us to review a new application and get them connected to tooling. It also takes a long time for us to perform that due diligence. Um, and as it is right now, our priority is on these due diligence reviews of existing allocators um, until we have more tooling to make that process faster uh, or we see you know, a significant need to increase the number of those. But again, every new allocator pathway that we approve means more of this work down the line, right? So if we scale up and we've got uh, 150 manual pathways, that's 150 manual diligence reviews that we're doing. Um, the, the economy of scale doesn't necessarily work in our favor by approving new pathways when it leads to longer and longer manual diligence reviews. So let's just kind of try and to, to paint that bigger picture, I know that everyone in this ecosystem is playing a part and they see a a part of the picture. And I only see a part of the picture too. I only see, you know, my lens. But looking at what's being posted in um, the the chat around, uh, you know, a review for issue for application number 71, as well as like this issue here. Just hopefully that paints a picture of what K Ray is kind of talking about that, that we have to balance those out. Nice point. Adam, what I'll do is I've got the link. I'm going to follow up with you in that issue. And hopefully we could flush that out a little bit. So then I'll save time at the end of this call to circle back to that, Adam. And then that way we can make sure with the new application, we've got some slides that we'll talk. Galen, thank you for that. I appreciate you adding that. Please keep them coming. So the second one is timelines. And I think that this is a really good thing that we could probably define a lot as a community working to kind of make this process the best it could possibly be. So two points that I'd like to discuss that come from this proposal. The first is allocator response. So you can see on the slides written, it's, it's kind of lining out zero to 72 hours, an allocator should make a response on that diligent review if questions are posted by the watchdog. And that that 72 hours should be kind of maintained between both parties, which means if the watchdog or Galen and myself leave a comment, we could realistically expect a return on that comment within 72 hours with a back and forth. And if we don't get that, kind of moving that issue into a blocking or a waiting category and revisiting it. And then the goal would be that there is a two week turnaround. So from the time that that diligence review comes in, to all the back and forth that may be needed to when that data cap goes out, that two weeks should be the goal. So I'd like to kind of put this up for community thoughts and discussion. And probably the first one is, is that 72 hours a realistic turnaround? And given weekends, given holidays, given expectations, and if we don't get that, how does that really look? So really looking for feedback either in chat or right here on thoughts on a 72 hour response SLA for both parties. Uh, hi, Galen, this is Irma, excuse me, from ND Labs. Yeah, mm. go ahead. Yeah, um, the or original source from us, we saw the zero to seven, uh, 72 hours is that the uh, working days. Um, because we know that uh, we are based in different time zone and uh, uh, we, we should be respectful to different uh, guys. I, I know some holidays like that. Uh, I think this 72 hours is not strict. Uh, it can be flexible and uh, like the 24 hours or the uh, ex except for holidays. Is exact uh exact, uh acceptable, I think. 
Yeah, I think you're getting on it. I think one thing that I would propose and we should be mindful of. So I live in California. So if an issue comes in from somebody who might be, let's just say Singapore, they're going to be 13 hours ahead in time zone. So if they publish it and then I get it, say California time, four o'clock on Friday, by the time Monday comes around, we're already at that 72 hour threshold. And so I think that's where we're going to see these outlier cases between holidays or weekends. So what I would propose and what comments I was going to leave in this issue is I, I love the goal of the 72 hours. What I would caution on is if we make it a hard and fast 72 hours, if we're freezing applications or coming back, I think we're going to see issue. But if we make the goal between the communication from the time this goes up, we're shooting for 72 hours. So I wanted to get input on making that a hard number or making it like the goal and then see how that comms comes back. Do you have any input on it? Um, let's see. I think the second option, like the goal, not uh, uh, might might be suitable. You got it. I think one thing too, and I'll open up some of these applications here a little bit later and have you take a look. One of the things that I've noticed too, as someone that's in here, is we might allocate time. Like, great, we're going to go through these diligence. Galen and I are going to take a look at each of these. It takes significant amounts of time. I'll just kind of put that out there. When we're doing these diligence checks, essentially what we have open is the fill watchdog post that's made in each one of these issues. We'll have the allocator application. We'll have all of the bookkeeping repos. We'll have all of the metrics that are out. And then we'll look at what distributions have gone out. It's very much time consuming. And then candidly, what happens is once Galen and I, it's almost like building a puzzle. We have it all lined out for that allocator, for that distribution refresh. And then there's a question. We essentially have to pause that whole work that we've done, pass it back to the allocator. And then when it comes back, reestablishing all of that again and getting the orientation and census. So having that additional information, we'll talk about that in one of the next issues, could help. Galen, I see your hand up. Floor is yours, of course. Yeah, I think there's a big difference between a reply and a resolution. Um, getting to a reply in 72 hours is, you know, is, is more doable. And again, setting these as goals, but not necessarily um, anything that uh, is, is kind of a block on either party. Um, but getting to a reply within 72 hours is much more doable than getting to a resolution. And so what I mean by that is like, as Carrie is saying, if we when we have to review lots of these components, if an issue comes in and there's you know, there are times when we're going back to different devs that are doing tooling, we're going back to different dashboards, and we're saying, hey, we're missing information here. And we're not able to complete a diligence review, because there's a, a third party kind of tooling thing that we need. Um, so it's more reasonable to say, like, we could, we could get a reply um, in that amount of time, but to expect like, yes, we have fully completed um, the process. It's also, I, I don't, I know that was on one of the slides earlier, but I think it is mentioned in this issue, the root key holder um, as like another kind of just a, a piece of this process. Once we complete these diligence reviews, we then have to go to the root key holders. They have to also check our work. So they also look through these different diligence review issues and they say, you know, did the governance team, did Galen and K Ray actually complete this? Is there a paper trail um, that exists? And so they're also reading through, is my resolution substantiated before they'll sign something on chain? And then in addition to that, there's tooling and on-chain issues. Every time there's a network upgrade, um, you know there there are implementation uh, issues for the root key holders. So, getting to 
successful, you know, an issue has been raised all the way through to it's completed. Um, we're just not at the point right now for that to be at 72 hours. I think it's reasonable to say we could get replies um, and even, you know, acknowledgements in that amount of time. And we could, we could I can kind of redouble efforts for that. It would be interesting to see ways to build a dashboard on that. If someone wants to, you know, we've long wanted um, some additional dashboards coming from the community around checking times for these things, doing kind of web hooks and, and times. Um, and oh, I had another idea and the, the train of thought has become derailed and left the station, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll pause here, but if it comes back to me, I'll raise my hand again. I think um, Irma has a hand. We'll kick it to her. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Gala. And uh, um, here's two thoughts from uh, your thoughts. And oh, one thing is that um, that's the cure. Uh, we, we, I think uh, most of us are curious about um, about the, this is the first time I know that the RKH uh, also have to review the due diligence and uh, uh, who is the RKH and uh, uh, why RKH also have to uh, review the due diligence. And uh, uh, it kind of take long times. Um, you may see that uh, watchdog review and the governor's team review and RKH review, that's the triple review and allocator review. Uh, it's kind um, no offense, but weird. And uh, uh, okay, good, give you. Yeah, yeah I can speak to that. Um, so they, the root key holder's job, and this is like laid out in FIP3 and laid out in different governance repos, their job is to audit the decisions of the governance team and the community. So when the governance team says someone else has applied to be an allocator, the root key holders need to say, is there sufficient paper trail to justify this request? And their job like, is to check as a stopgap to say, uh, if, if the governance team posted and said, you know, let's stand up a new allocator and give it one exabyte of data cap, and there was no paper trail that said, yeah, here's where the community had a conversation about that. Here's where you know, we discussed it in a governance call. Here's where we have justified that new allocator and that amount. The root key holders should not just approve it. So just because the governance team says, you know, please sign this message, they need to go and say, well, their job is to audit those proposals that the governance team makes to them. So they're not having to go through and perform the same audit that we do. They're not checking all of our work in the sense of saying, oh, well, you applied you, you requested 20 PIDs for this person. Let me go look at all of their allocations. What they're doing is they're saying, did you go look at their allocations? And so when I post these comments that say, here's the diligence review, you know, Filecoin Watchdog opened it. Um, here's where we had a conversation back and forth. Here's the comment thread. Here's our, here's link to their initial application. The root key holders can go and look and say, okay, the address that you are asking for 20 PIBs matches the address in the initial application. Because again, like I could make a mistake just as an accident and, and mismatch an address and the burden is on the root key holders to kind of perform those types of checks to say, yes, I'm giving the, this data cap to a known address. Here's the evidence that that is the correct address. So it's things like that that they are... Um, they are auditing, not necessarily the same kind of audit. So I know it's, I know it's, it, it is, yes, it's, there's multiple parties checking here, but that's the reason is because they're checking different things and it balances out sort of these checks on the system so that if I miss something, they're looking for different pieces of it. Um, the other piece that I had forgot a moment ago that I want to speak to here relates to this which is there have been some proposals and there is some work around changing to these different meta allocator structures where a 
um, we would receive an application for a meta allocator. For example, all of the um, you know automated diligence pathways would be under one meta allocator, and they would have a certain set of rules uh, and teams with balances under that meta allocator, and then the root key holders would approve a larger lump of data cap to that smart contract meta allocator. And then it would have balances underneath. And then what could be happening is we wouldn't need the um, we wouldn't need the root key holders to send a new message on chain to send data cap to an, to the F2 allocator pathway every time. So what we could do, for example, is we could set up a smart contract with, and I'm just throwing some of these numbers out, like 100 pibs of data cap to a smart contract and the structure of that smart contract would say these 40 F2 addresses are authorized under this smart contract. This address has access to five PIBs. This one has access to five. This one has already been approved twice. It has access to 10, for example. And then as those addresses allocate out from that smart contract and their balance starts to run out, they get audited and reviewed and we change the smart contract to say, great, this team, look, using Indie Labs as an example, you know, they've used their allocation, they're ready for more. We completed that audit, we approved it. And it just goes through that smart contract. And that smart contract has a larger lump of data cap available to it. Then what happens is as that entire hundred PIBs starts to run down, we say, great, this system is working. It's a more automated way where the root key holders are not checking every um, allocator pathway that's happening by the governance team and by the community, then the root killers can say, great, let's give that smart contract you know, 200 PIBs and build more of that runway. So it's, it's just a similar way of scaling this, this problem that we've always had, which is we shouldn't give a whole lot of data cap to a, a client right away should give them a small amount, let them start working, trust, and then verify. We shouldn't give a whole lot of data cap to an allocator right away. We should give them a smaller amount, have them start working, and then trust and verify and continue to scale that trust over time by giving larger allocations of data cap to give them more runway and also to just change the kind of the workload. Um, so that's another place where we're investigating like ways to decrease this time. Um, and I know Will Scott and the Fiddle team have been working on some of those meta allocator pathways to say, like, let's have a smart contract that has signers within it um, and balances within it. So we're we are investigating. Um, I understand that like there's no one silver bullet to like make this whole process seamless and and painless and work faster. Um, taking it back to an earlier comment, that is the balance kind of that we're doing. If we just approve a whole bunch of new allocators that apply and we approve them all really quickly, we're making a ton of work for ourselves when we get to the due diligence reviews. If we only focus on these really manual due diligence reviews and approving those, they remain really burdensome and they don't scale. So we need more tooling to do that. But at the same time, there's still these humans in the loop. If we invest in other types of tooling and other structures, we can potentially grow to other scales, but we don't know the right format and what works yet. So we are learning as we do this to say, well, what are the places where we can automate these diligence reviews? Um, and we've been doing that things from last year to now with the CID checker bot. And that's, you know, just yet another example where like the, there's a lot of people in this ecosystem that are making changes and, and owning this open source tooling and software. And as things change with the way deals are structured and the, the new DDO versus the market actor, that has an impact on the tooling that we're able to design. And we have to uh, you know, work to adapt and modify to that changing landscape. As we launch new bots that report on retrieval, that changes the information that we gain about clients and allocator behavior. And it isn't always perfect. And then we get other teams building other bots. So taking it like back to this issue around you know maximum time frame for allocator due diligence review as a like micro you know micro example like i think that we can set some sla targets of replies 
um, while we continue to like work towards automating these things. Um, and I appreciate again, like the, the, the conversation and I would love to see more teams like making more examples, like build another dashboard that shows these timelines um, so that we have evidence so that we can say, great, we did an analysis on when an application was opened to when it got the replies. We can, you know, we can track that with, with looking at GitHub web hooks. Um, you know, we used to do this with our time to data cap um, calculations. And like we had a, some strong metrics around uh, TTD and like how long it took to get replies um, and data cap out to uh, notaries and then out to clients. So let's look at sort of these governance time to time to diligence, time to review. Um, but K Ray, back to you. All right. Thanks, Galen. Make sure I get my webcam here set up. I'd like to kind of dive into the third point on this one, which is looking at how we're actually approaching some of these going forward. So the next one is the root key holder, and this kind of came up as a question. So kind of getting into this a little bit here. With the root key holders, we don't share who they are just for security purposes because they control essentially the whole ledger for all data cap and just kind of protecting theirs. But one of the issues that we have that Galen mentioned is awaiting their review and then their signing and then pushing that out. This could be low hanging fruit for us to kind of come back and look at it. So I think what Galen and I can commit to is looking at this process and seeing if we can maybe buy back some time for once the diligence is reviewed before that root key holder. So we'll look into that and we'll kind of come back to you with updates as they come in. And then this is the point that I'm hoping that we could discuss. These are some like clear cut ways that we could speed this up. Because if I'm hearing correctly, this is an issue. And if it's an issue for you, it's an issue for us. So we'll try to work on solving this and improving it. So number one, it might be helpful for us to look at how we have that application for diligence reviews. We've kind of kept away from the template model because so many allocators have different pathways, different ways of doing it. Maybe there is value to having a standardized form that every allocator fills out we had avoided this for like the bureaucracy that comes, but this might be a fast way where if allocators know exactly what to list, link, and speak to, we could shorten that question and answer time. So I will take action on making a first draft of that. I'll link it to the issue that was formed, and I'll share it in the Slack channel for your input on is this overly burdensome or does this help? So I'll make that template and push out to you. The second is we're starting that right now, and that's defining what does response look like? Is it 72 hours? Is it a week? What is a realistic timeline for when an allocator hits that 70% data threshold that they can start to get that recap? One thing I will say, and Galen kind of touched on this, the first data cap refresh is always the most difficult. And then when it comes to the second, third, fourth, all subsequent, they go much faster because there's much more of an understanding from the allocator's point, and we have data that we can go back to. So I'm optimistic that as this program kind of finds its legs and gets going, we can kind of have something. So I think defining that SLA will be great. I'll make the comments in the issue. I'd love to hear yours too. And then the third was improving the speed on the root key holder. So once we have everything completed on the watchdog, on the governance side, how can we get that root key holder signature really quick and out the door and so can speed that up? You'll see that category four is a question. I'm curious if anybody else has thoughts like, hey, please try this or please take this into account. I'd love to hear your thoughts now. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, me again. Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, back to Galen's point, and also for this input, and uh, I really liked uh, uh Galen's point is that uh, two ways. One is structure, and one is tooling, and we have uh, we have on this two ways together, and the tooling, and uh, now it has a fiddle, fiddle team to create more uh, smart contract. And also I believe more community members are willing to um, develop 
small uh tooling like if you have needs or uh, uh in some uh specific point uh specific area and uh, uh need us to <clears throat> develop it and we'd love to <clears throat> and also the other one uh, is is uh structure structure now is that the purpose we have raised um we think that um we have to uh basically determine the uh timeline and uh the background now the current situation is that uh one of the parties uh has res respond but uh, another one uh has no follow up and uh, um like uh for example um if if uh watchdog has raised a uh <clears throat> question for one allocator and there is a long time uh, no follow up no uh, response from that allocator and um if this would uh like the uh within 2 weeks uh if if they ha don't have response within 2 weeks uh it will be closed and uh, like this allocator will no longer have this um data cap re refresh for this time like um yeah and also the other point is that uh if the allocator has respond uh within two weeks and within 72 hours and there's no other uh, uh like the no other follow-up respond from the like governor's team or watchdog review <clears throat> and some um like the allocators my might uh they don't know whether they have made a de decision or uh, waiting for more information they have to be provided uh that's kind of issue <clears throat> so the thing gonna pause here um so uh like we proposed we have to set a timeline the two weeks is uh that we have to and we must to have the conclusion uh, to see whether this uh, allocator can be or not be refreshed. It's a great point. Thank you for adding that clarifying. If I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is let's keep a lot of those details soft, but let's keep the hard timeline two weeks. So if ND Labs submits a request for refresh, ND Labs can confidently assume that within two weeks, they'll have data cap refresh, or they'll at least have an identifying on what needs to be done to get that refresh in two weeks. Am I um, hearing, hearing you no. correct? Um, it's just it's just a decision not to have to complete it done. Um, like the, uh, it have to be, have the uh, common decision and like the, uh, uh, the both party have to have the uh say have to in same page yeah that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. i appreciate you sharing that does anybody else have any thoughts or any additional points they'd like to add before we move on from that topic and start to put it in writing in the issue All right. Well, once again, ND Labs, thank you for putting this forward. Thank you for kicking this discussion off. We will take these slides. I'll put it in the proposal and we'll see. And the next steps that I have is I'm going to work on this form in GitHub and I'll get that up quick so that you guys can take a look. And again, the goal would be what information is needed that we get that as quickly as possible to eliminate the back and forth between all parties. And then again, the more data cap refresh that goes out with these folks, the easier it gets. So we've already weeded out some bad actors. And as those are weeded out, ideally what we're left with is those of you that contribute are doing great work and we can just get out of your way and let you do that. So thank you. All right, Adam, this might hit to your question earlier about what is the status of my application to join right now and what are we looking at? So we've had this slide before. I just want to kind of reiterate this again and what Galen kind of touched on is that we have around 52 manual allocators that are set up bookkeeping, distributing data cap, 
and they have a very good process already with establishing who they are and what they're doing. We're very reticent about adding more manual allocators because it's an inverse reaction. The more allocators that we have doing that manual process, the more bookkeeping, accounting takes place on the governance team, which takes away time for other things. And what I mean by that is when we set up a new allocator, we're setting up multi-sigs, we're setting up repos, we're setting up slacks and comms, we're making sure that those comms work. It's a very tedious process. Then you add on the KYC. So we've been hesitant to add just new allocators for the sake of having new allocators. Since for a client to get data cap, there's essentially 52 ways that that client can get data cap right now. What would be special about adding a 53rd? And that's what this request for allocator really comes down to. So when we get these new requests, what we're looking at is, does this new application do anything different than the existing 52? And so what we've kind of spelled out in that request and what Galen talked about earlier is we're looking for allocators that might be coming on new that are just doing something different. They're either having like a spigot set up with Glyph, they're using GitHub, they have their own tooling. They're looking at a way that's just not, hey, I got a client, they sent me an application, I reviewed it, I signed it, I sent the data cap. Because again, there's 52 allocators that are doing that. So really spelling out why this is different is a, is a fast track. So Adam, to your question, what I'll do is I'll come into your issue. It looks like it's number 137 or number 71, 71. And I'll spell out essentially like, why is this the same? And then what will we be looking for as far as something new? That way, if you are really looking to kind of get involved in the community and really come on board, we could help you with that without kind of burdening the program in the process. So Adam, I'll take action to reply to you in issue number 71 and kind of have the conversation there. And at the very least, kind of spell out, have you ready or take a look as we lose some allocators to maybe backfill and go forward. But Adam, I wanted to ask you specifically, since you had asked in chat, if you had any questions or why your application hasn't been onboarded. All right. Well, if anything comes up, please let me know and we'll keep following up. I think our goal is to always make sure that there is a place for anybody who wishes to contribute. So Adam, if that's you, I'll follow up and figure out how we can best take advantage of the skills and knowledge that you bring to the program. So thanks for being here and we'll figure out a way to kind of help get you in if that's what you're looking for. We have two topics left. Um, real quick, just wanted to check in on an issue that was flagged in the allocator channel. This had to do with an error. So when PhilScan signed in to the registry, they couldn't sign on their repo. Just wanted to make sure for everybody, one of the most helpful things in what PhilScan did is they put screenshots in there. You may see once the screenshots come back, there's gonna be a request for some additional information. That is really, really helpful. And I think what the developers are looking at is like what was showing up on the ledger when this happened and then was the approval made? And then did all the address information match? So if you check in the tooling, that's where it will be. And Fiddle did a great job of putting together a repo. You'll see it linked here in red in the slide deck for all of the known issues that come up. So whenever a new issue gets flagged in tooling, we always try to take a look and see, can we retool that FAQ to make it a little bit more helpful for you? So just want to check in. This has been received. They're working on the tooling and we'll have an update as it comes through. So thank you, Phil Scan. I got a DM from Josh over at Non-Entropy Tech who wanted a few minutes just to give us a short demo on their retrieval tool bot that they're working on. Love to see that. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Josh, if you're still on the call, I'll turn the floor over to you. If you want to okay. screen share, show us the demo, the floor is yours. Okay, I will share my screen. And can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to take you a lot of time since we are running late and I will quickly go through this demo. So, but please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. So we are, uh, we have been working on to develop a multiple tool compatible retrieval board. And I'm Josh from Annotator 1022. And so go the goal is, is to, sorry, 
He is to develop a tool that is multiple tool compatible. That is, we can use either Nancy or Boost or hopefully later we can support uh, Venus and uh, DDO. And uh, we focus on customer customized retrieval and uh, we hopefully we can get it user friendly. And these are the milestones. The uh, So currently we are as the milestone three, and hopefully we can open source the code within this week. And uh, here is the demo. And the first part is the API development. So as I discussed in uh, Slack channels, we uh, before we run the test, we need to get the data CIDs of the of the tiers. So we have developed this API, and this URL is the endpoint that anyone can can try. And there are like uh, one, two, five, one, two, three, four, five parameters and uh, the client and SP parameters are required and uh, the left have some default values. So the required params is the client and the SP. So it will retrieve the data CIDs um, made in DIOs between this client and the SP. The end time, the default is current time and the start is current time minus 30 days. And the limit will be five for default. So if we run this command, it will return the list of data CIDs between this client and this SP. And if, of course, to save the resources, we, we run a very low end server, so we limit the request to 10 per minute for now. And after we get the data CID list, we can run the test. So from the both side, it will first pass the command. It will retrieve the data CIDs uh, with the SP and the client pair. Then it will run retrieval test one by one. And then it will connect the result and the comment back to the GitHub issue. So here is an example that I run the bot with boost. So it will trigger run retrieval test. The method we use here is boost. The SP list is separated by comma. The client address is provided. And for test purpose, we are only testing three. So the result shows here. Because uh, the, the, the 23422 does not have any deals with this client, so it shows non available And for the other two, it shows uh, some level of retrieval rate. And here is a log uh, on the back end. So first, uh, it retrieve all the data CIDs. And with this SP, there is no, so it return an MPD list. And then it runs the retrieval, so for the it's executing the boost retrieval command, it's signing and it start to transmit data and that means it's retrievable. And here is an example of failure. So the SP, the deal, the retrieval deal is rejected. So that will be counted as a failure. And similarly, we try the same thing with Nancy and uh, uh, the result is different. Suggesting that the SPs support uh, different tools at different level. And here is a, so uh, the different part is with Nancy, we need the multi address to dial. So we first run dot state minor info to get the multi address of the storage provider. And then we use that to retrieve. And it's dining and it's a start to transmit the data and it means the success. And here is also the data transfer field deal rejected. It counts as a failure. So here I run a side by side comparison between Spark and our retrieval result. It's in the same uh, client application. So from our end, the F0142232 got zero retrieval rate. However, with the same list, uh, these three, 0, 1, 3, 0, 2, 4, and 0, 2, 3, uh, 
quote zero retrieval rate. Suggesting that our system and the Spark system has some difference and uh, and are explained later why. And here is a side by side comparison. So uh, the data source means we how we get the data CID from Spark. They get the information from indexer node. That is the SP has to publish like broadcast what they have sealed to the indexer node so that the indexer node will connect this information and uh, uh, run by Spark. But for our, we monitor every published story deals messages on chain and uh, get the data CIDs from these messages. And the specificity, so the Spark, it checks the global retrieval rate. For, for example, when it checks the retrieval rate of one particular storage provider, it checks the the, the whole history of deals that are made with the storage provider. But in our system is client specific. So we can check specifically the deals between this client and this storage provider. And time range, time range, uh, I'm not sure. I didn't find any information about time range on Spark, but for us, it's customized. You, you appoint some start date and end date. And the retrieval client, as far as I know, Spark used Nancy, and for our system, we can customize it. You can use either Nancy or Boost or any other uh, supported tools we might support later. And automation. So the good part about Spark is fully automated, but for our system, we have to manually trigger it. And for response, a lot of people complain about uh, Spark system is that, for example, in this Slack channel, they do not know when their SP will be included in their result. However, for our system, we the result can be immediately get after seeing. So that's a difference. So I'm not saying that our is better than Spark, but at least we can say that our system is a good complement to the Spark system. And so some work in progress, we are working on to support Venus, and also we are working on the, uh, to support deals made by DDO. But the difficult part is that with DDO, it's difficult, really difficult to get the data CID. So maybe, in this time, we really need to depend on the indexer node. And uh, we are trying to make the triggering command more user friendly. We are trying to connect the client address and the pin list from the issue content so that we do not have to manually write it. And we are also add some error handling and make the boot more robust before we open source it. And yeah, that's what I want to share. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for sharing. I'm so excited to see the development of this. Um, really looking forward to it. I hope mm -hmm. you are in contact with uh, Venus. I think you probably are in working with them. Um, hopefully you're also in contact with uh, Spark. Let us know mm -hmm. um, if you need help working with, uh, working with them. We've heard from a number of teams that the data CID with DDO is a problem for various tools. Um, it's kind of a, a a bigger issue than any one team is set up to solve. Um, I know A North uh, had a lot of work uh, involved in changing that market actor. Um, so I think he is probably a subject matter expert. Uh, it would be great okay. to kind of see like pinging them. Um, uh, so two two questions. Question number one, just a quick check. It sounds like this can work alongside Spark to get sort of two different types of retrieval scores. You don't have to necessarily pick either or. Is that correct? Uh, uh, can you repeat your question again? Just that if we were looking at deal making as an aggregate for clients mm -hmm. that are getting data cap from one allocator, we could get a score for their retrieval through Spark, 
but we could also get a score for their retrieval through this yes. platform as well. And we could compare them both and they would yes. both tell us sort of different but related pieces of information. Yes. Uh, for example, oh. in this slide, it's the same uh, client uh, from the single annotator. And we run these two, uh, two tests at the, almost at the same time and do this comparison. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then the last question that I have, we're like a little over time, so I'm sorry. I appreciate people being able mm -hmm. to stay if you can. What uh, what do you need from the other allocator community? What do you need from the governance team um, to kind of keep developing and releasing this? Do you need some other people to review the bot? Do you need other allocators to want to test it? How can we how can we help? Uh, we are good for now. The only kind of concern is that since we are connecting every uh, public story deal message from the from the chain, and our database is getting bigger and bigger, maybe maybe uh, in the future some someone from the field pass team or from Proton Labs can run this bot so that they can they can hold the bigger database. Mm -hmm. And is this, the database is all of the, um, the deal information. Is there another team that we know that is already hosting that database with data cap stats? Mm -hmm. Is that a redundant set of information? Yeah, that's, that's what I first want. So in the very beginning of this project, I looked around this, the community tools to see if we can get the data CID easily. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any tools. So that's why we built this by ourselves. Mm -hmm. OK. That makes sense. Cool. Um, looking forward to seeing more. And then, you know, where is the best place for people to Kind of see it do you have like a, a repo or a governance issue where people could you could ask questions and we could connect you yeah, with other i have a, a issue about this i'll post it here awesome and... Hold on. Um, while he's doing that, uh, if there are other questions um, in the chat, we're a little bit over time. Um, thank you, everybody. There was a question in the chat about when will the watchdog comment. They, they usually comment when an allocator hits 75% um, uh, balance used. Um, and we're working again on making that um, uh, more automated and building an automated bot that will post that diligence comment. Um, there's some other people asking about compliance reviews. Um, so we're reviewing those, you know, as we, as we can prioritize and get to them, <clears throat> there should be more reviews and comments happening uh, this week. Um, some various people are off at different times in August. Uh, yeah. Nothing else from me. Thank you for the tooling demonstration. K Ray, anything else from you? No, just happy to be here. Thanks, Gail. Fantastic. Well, thanks everybody for um, staying over. And there'll be another uh, governance call in a, in a few hours. So maybe see some of you then. Um, otherwise, see you in Slack and GitHub and on the next call in two weeks. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Oh, by the way, sorry, Kevin.
Oh, uh, I shared about the uh the the issues, not the issues. Sorry, uh, issues one three zero for the G G H allocator. So, uh, I know just like you guys are talking about like it, it may take time to have a turnaround time to get it. Like not not say that uh to solve it, but maybe respond. Uh, appreciate mm -hmm. you guys to look at it. Yeah, for the comment from the watchdog, which has really been responded as well. Awesome. Yep. I have it open. We'll go. Yeah, it's a long one. This. Very long one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's a, there's a number of them that are long and a lot of back and forth. And, you know, we read back to the first review, we read back to the original application. And I want to try and keep all the, all the facts uh, straight so that I don't conflate you know, mix up yeah. different allocators and things like that. But thank you. All right. Thanks for that. Bye, everybody. Well, friendly hellos. Welcome back to the second allocator call taking place on August 20th. This call will be a mirror from the recording session from the morning, but let's take a look at the two main points we have to go over. The majority of the time on this call is dedicated to data cap refresh, essentially looking at the way that we do it right now, collecting feedback from you on what's working and what can be improved, and ideally make this process as easy and simplified for everyone involved. So that's what the main topic is that we'll be going over. On the FAQ portion, we have some updates to the tooling just to check in to make sure everyone's tracking. And there'll be lots of time at the end if there's anything you guys want to dive into. As a reminder, this call is taking place on August 20th. The next call is slated for 3rd of September. And if you're keen to follow any of these meetings, linked in the slide deck is the calendar invite. If you add that to your Google Shared calendar, it will automatically pop up for you as you go forward. And then just a quick check-in on metrics. Over the last two weeks, we've seen 12 new client applications processed, which resulted in 40 petabytes of data cap distributed, and we're still seeing activity from 54 active allocators from the 72 that's been signed up. All right, let's talk data cap refresh. So we have a proposal that was filed from ND Labs, fabulous, we're gonna dive into that. And that's really one of the drivers that what we're looking at is for what is this data cap refresh process like, and why is it the way it's set up? So taking a look at the slide that you see right now, Essentially, allocators, as you know, are serving between the intermediary of the clients, the governance, and then the root key holders. So right now, what happens is as the allocators work with the clients to go back and forth, once that time has been processed, the community review takes place. So this could be myself, this could be Galen, this could be the Phil Watchdog, taking a look at what distributions were made, and then giving the allocator a chance to kind of speak to any one of those. So right now, there is a lot of back and forth between the Phil Watchdog and the allocators, then myself and Galen and the allocators, and then lastly, if the root key holders then have a clarifying question. So we're going to dive into what that workflow looks like with the goal of getting input you may have to make that easier for you. So the big items that are being looked at with the data cap refresh are retrievals. Are they increasing or are they high up? Is there bookkeeping communication and KYC for each application that comes in to verify the data? Do the SPs that the client lined out actually match what's taking place? And if not, has the allocator taken steps to kind of discuss that with the client? And then fourth, does the distribution schedule match a relationship of trust? So we're looking at these and we match them to what was put in each allocator's application to join the program. What are some reasons that there's delays right now? So some applications can get processed really quick, I would say within that two week window, and some applications have stretched out for a matter of weeks. Here are some of the reasons for some of those delays. So number one is that there's missing information in the diligence review. So when the Phil watchdog governance goes through, if they can't find a bookkeeping repo or they can't find any KYC, Essentially, what that means is it has to go back, get more information from the allocators, or kick off a rather lengthy investigation where the governance team or the Phil Watchdog from the community is giving input, 
So that really slows it down. If we can't find bookkeeping or we can't find the information. The second is if information doesn't match. We've seen this happen where if somebody files a diligence review from a GitHub account that's not linked to their client's application, slows it down having to verify it. Or if the information for the SPs isn't what was actually done when we check these numbers. So if any information doesn't match, then there's a back and forth to try to get that accurate information out and then return to it. And then the third, information's not complete. So I mentioned not having the bookkeeping repo, not having anything set up. Whenever there's that back and forth, that again slows it down. And one of the reasons why that process takes so long is when these checks are done by the governance team, they might be pushed out in a batch. And think about it almost like if they're being done, there's a lot of information that needs to be collected. So if we have to come back to it again, it's almost like rebuilding from the start. So we'll talk a little bit about where we have seen some information not put in these forms and really kind of give you some ideas on how we could help you give us the information so we're not having to ask back and forth as we go through it. And the fourth reason why it's the time from once the community looks at the application, once the governance team has reviewed the application, then the root key holder essentially checks all of our work. So ways that we can increase that delay might be improving that root key holder. So on this call, we'll be diving forward into these four categories and getting your input on ways to make that more effective. So the applications were looked at, and there's this new one, 137. It's a proposal from ND Labs. Great proposal. And what they're outlining is, let's take a look at this process and let's try to get that time frame under two weeks. So the goal is, as an allocator, once you hit that 70% data cap distribution rate, it triggers, and then it should be much more easy from the date that it triggers to the date that you're getting topped off, where you as a business can count on that being within two weeks. I think this is great. I think this is worth investing in, and that's why we're kind of taking some time to discuss it. So in this proposal, one of the things they asked for was, who were the roles and responsibilities on the team? So great, I'd be happy to talk about that before I put it in the issue. From the governance team, it's Galen and myself. So what I work on is almost trying to be like a support mechanism to make sure that the program has what it's needs, architecturally speaking. So I get everything set up for these calls, get everything set up with the GitHub, and make sure that we're connected on this part. But I'm not the one who's actually reviewing this and giving that final. That's what Galen does. What Galen does is he is the overall head for the Phil Plus program. So he is the one that takes a look at all of the information that comes back and gives it that kind of stamp from the governance side that this meets the expectations of the program or it doesn't. We also have an unlisted reviewer from the community and the ecosystems that are essentially pulling that data back and trying to make a first pass. So the allocators are very welcome to make their data cap refresh if they don't make the request, then the Phil Watchdog will see that and then they'll put that in. So that's a member of the communities. And what they're trying to do is look at it from like, hey, what's going on? And lastly are the root key holders. These are the individuals that actually control the ledger that controls all of the data cap. We don't publish their names just for security because they essentially sit on the ledger that controls all of this data cap, but it's individuals that are closely connected with the program and the community and they've kind of been apported to this position to kind of oversee it. So what the root key holder does is steps in from a higher level to audit everything, the reviewers, the governance team, the allocators themselves, and they kind of put their, their final blessing before the data cap goes out. What about time? Well, if you look at this, one of the requests in this proposal was, how do we get this time shortened? So the goal is within two weeks from an application being filed, that data cap is back on your ledger for disbursements. So one of the things we're talking about is one of the delays is say a Phil watchdog makes a issue. Then we wait for the allocator to review that issue and provide their feedback. And then the Phil watchdog comes and leaves additional comments or Galen and myself might come leave additional comments. And there is this back and forth. Sometimes with this back and forth, it could take a member of time or it could take a few days. So I think the first thing we wanted to kind of define was what is a reasonable timeline 
for response as we get these GitHub. So in the morning, we talked about 72 hours and why that works and why it doesn't. I'd be really curious to get your input on the timelines for how this works. This would be timelines for response. All right. Well, hearing none, in the morning, we talked about why 72 hours works well, but why it could have problems. The issue we had was holidays. So if one member of the planet has a holiday on Friday and then someone might not come in. So we talked about rather than making it set in stone 72 hours, the goal would be to respond to these issues within 72 hours, both governance, both the allocators. So I'll leave that in ticket. If you have strong thoughts, please let me know. And then the third thing in this proposal was data cap is distributed within the first two weeks. That's the goal we're trying to get to. How can we strengthen that root key holder? Right now, like I mentioned, that root key holder is essentially doing a final audit, like a test before it goes out, and then they're issuing that data cap. So what we're looking at is how can we take the information that we've collected and give this to the root key holders so that it's much more of a quick process versus a final review that could be slowing that down. So in this, the data cap is distributed from the two weeks. So diligence review kicks off back and forth with these 72 hours for any questions to get them back and forth. That would be response. So 72 hours, then 72 hours back. And then that would go forward in that two weeks. So the brainstorms that we have are one coming up with a form that you could just auto complete inside of the registry. So right now, if you file your own diligence review request, you're kind of taking the model that the Phil Watchdog has been using to kind of push that out from a tooling perspective. So one of the things that I'm going to take action on is I will make a form inside of GitHub that essentially collects with dropdowns all the information with pre-populated checks. The hope is that the form will take probably 20% longer to fill out but it will eliminate a lot of the back and forth questions, which is really the slowdown in this whole process. So I'll push this out for feedback once it's done, but essentially the goal is that you can auto-complete that form and get that information out to the root key holder as fast as possible. Two, what we're looking at is having a more clear-cut defined SLA. So essentially once this goes up to root key holders, we know within 72 hours they will sign it and have it back. Or once the Phil Watchdog sends a request, they'll have it back to you within 72 hours. I'd be really curious if you look at point number four, any input, thoughts, or suggestions on ways to increase the speed for this data cap refresh. I'd love to take note. So in chat, I see a few comments. I'll circle back to every one of these, but hash, I see yours. The back and forth may take more than two weeks. It sure will. I think the goal is that we, we being the governance team, aren't the ones that are resulting in the two weeks. If this is a pain point for you guys, it's a pain point for us. So I'm looking at what can we do on our side? If we're committing to 72 hours, that could do it. But yeah, you're right, hash. If there's information, it could take longer. One of the things that I've been seeing from my own personal anecdote is the first data cap refresh takes the longest. We have to figure out what to look at. Allocators have to figure out. Once it comes down to the second and third, it should be pretty clear cut. Unless there's a very clear violation, it's pretty easy to see. So hopefully that'll be a lot faster. But good point. I'm going to circle back to some of the questions in chat. So Harry, I see yours. How often will the watchdog trigger allocator diligence review? This is a manual process right now. So essentially what the fill watchdog account does is it goes to fill plus. They take a look at which allocators have utilized their data cap and have reached that point. We have a request in with the fiddle team for tooling 
to make this automated. So rather than having to manually look at who's reaching that 70% threshold and check in on it, there is a bot that will auto trigger and file this. So ideally this gets a lot tighter right now. It's manual and we should see that come better. And fat man is watchdog part of the fiddle team. Watchdog uses some of the tooling that fiddle puts together. So fiddle works on the registry. We have the pulse page that will tie back to your ledger IDs for the data cap stats page. And so what I've asked fiddle to do is help us make sure that this is as transparent as possible for you. So KZ is actually working on like, Hey, what do we see in those watchdog accounts from like the points raised on data distribution to storage providers, what links are being used to check. And so hopefully this removes any of the black box mystery where everyone can see which storage providers are selected for which data cap. So Phil Fiddle is working on the tooling to make that much more easier for the watchdog as it goes through. And then Mike, I see your question about your application. What I'll do is at the end of the call, we'll circle back to that one and go forward on it. Sweet. Last question that comes up on this topic is there is limited bandwidth right now between running the program, onboarding, getting the data distributions and all the documentation. So on the last few calls, we've talked about this for new applications. We've received 11 new requests to join the allocator program for organizations. And right now we're holding them in kind of a pattern while we wait for bandwidth to work up. And the reason for it is we have 54 active allocators that are doing the manual review process. Each time we add an allocator to that, there's significant work between onboarding, KYC, getting everything set up, and then the support that goes through it. So unless an allocator right now at this time is doing something novel that's not that, we're kind of iceboxing those applications. For a client perspective, they have 54 wonderful allocators that they could reach out to for data cap. So the value add of giving them 55, 56, 57 is very low, but those additional allocators take away time from governance to do those other things. So if you have an application in, we're just kind of holding those for a moment, but fast tracking and prioritizing anybody who's doing something novel besides the manual allocators. And then as far as FAQ and tooling, you might have seen a comment in chat come through over from PhilScan. They were reporting that when they were in the registry and they go to sign, they were getting an error message. I wanted to commend them on one, just kind of kicking that ticket off and giving the information. And two, give a soft plug to Fiddle. They've put together a web page for tooling issues. So you may see some of these come up before. Some of the tooling questions that come back from devs in order to troubleshoot this as fast as possible was like, was the ledger connected? Were there matches made? Could you see that on allocator tech? So we'll keep you updated as this bug gets worked out, but that should kind of be the one, two back and forth on that one as they clean that up this week. So with that kind of a discussion on data cap stats, kind of checking on the allocator applications, checking on tooling, happy to dive into anything on your mind or that you want to look at right now. So Mike, I see your question in chat. We'll just get started there. So let's pull up your application and see where we stand on this one right now. So Mike, this is your second one coming through here for RF Phil. And just a quick check in here, get my bearings where we left this. So, Mike, it looks like this other one was still impacted by the ST fill. I think that there was a lot of investigation that was going on specifically for why that was such a high number for these storage proposals, but we didn't see that same distribution across. Mike, let me follow up with 
someone we had working on the fraud team for looking at the ST fill situation and why this was impacting. Last I saw, it was trying to figure out why these storage providers were dispersed at a higher ratio than anybody else in the program and kind of getting a feel. But thank you for kind of putting these right here where we can see the performance of the rates increasing and kind of going back out. So it looks like there was some back and forth with you and KZ. Let me nudge this thread and then we'll kind of get it. But this is a great example. So like Mike, this kicked off three weeks ago. And for like the last two weeks, we've been having these back and forth conversations. It'd probably be nice for you to have a date like, hey, this is where we're going to finally like draw the line in the sand. What additional information do we need? And where do we need additional context? So I'm going to use this one and I'll ping KZ and I'll see if everything is good to go. And I'll follow up with the trust to make sure everything was set. And I'll echo back. Mike, thanks for flagging this and I'll leave a comment here. And Jimmy, I see your question in chat about a member of the Filecoin asking about his application. So essentially, Jimmy, you could let them know that if their application is another manual pathway, like the existing 54 that we have, we will just leave it in the proposal and pending for the time being, because there's really no benefit right now for having additional allocators doing the manual process. We're only looking for like ways to strengthen that through a novel approach that's going forward. So feel free to DM me their application. I'll be happy to chat with them. Or if they're doing anything that's different besides manual, because there's no slowdown for a client to get in touch with an allocator. There's lots of data. So we're trying to really prioritize time to things outside of that manual. So if they have any questions, let me know or feel free to put them in touch with me on Slack. Ash, let's take a look at yours. Pulling it up. All right, so you had filed this. Let's see what the tooling came back with. Yeah, I think we're looking at the 23. That was definitely like a, a hard number. And then the allocations that went out. Hash, let me get someone to leave a comment here. I don't want to speak without having a lot of information, which was knowing more about where that was the test. And then this organization here. Yeah, Hash, let me take a look at this. I don't know why this one is still in a holding pattern. I kind of agree with you. What I'm seeing is the data cap distributions increasing over time. You have the two clients that you served. We have the bookkeeping repo. Let me see if there's anything blocked on this one, and then I'll come back. So I'm taking a note here for movement to try to get this on here for you as well. Especially, I think this is your second, if I'm not mistaken. Ash, is this your first data cap refresh that you've done, or is this your second? All right, Hash, I just posted a chat for you when you see it. Just let me know if this is first or second, and I'll leave a comment. And Lynn, let's take a look here. This is also a really old one. So yeah, let's get these cleared out. You shouldn't have to be 
back and forth for this long. So we have the last review. This is your second for the EF allocator. You've kicked this off. We have the KYC verification, the SPs. Let's kind of get a feel for where this landed with the watchdog. So what Watchdog was wanting to understand was why the SPs were different from the retrieval. And then essentially very limited due diligence. So the Watchdog was asking for more clear-cut questions and kind of come back in five days ago. So this would have been Friday. You've reached out. We're waiting for them to respond. Lynn, let me follow up with the watchdog and the tooling. I think the last issue that was blocked was kind of verifying these SPs and figuring out why those were used and where they haven't come back for. So let me make a ping on this one too. So I'll be updating these three tickets in the hope of getting this through. But yeah, the goal is that this is July 8th and right now we're well into August. So making sure that we get this back and forth kind of lined out for you as quickly as possible. So that way we go three weeks, two weeks, two weeks. And so we'll get this set up. So thanks for flagging this. I've got this in my notes and we'll hopefully get an update for you as we go on this too. Got it. Any others or anything that's on your mind that we want to look at? I've got those four applications. I'll follow up with those teams to see if I can get them to move on it for you. Is there anything else top of mind that we could do to make your lives improved as we go through it? All right. Then hash, Jimmy, Mike, I've got action items. Jimmy, I'm feel free to tag me with the member who wanted to be curious about their application. If nothing else, I can get them in some of the channels while they wait or give them some ideas on very simple, low hanging fruit for an automated tooling that would go in there to get them in the program. Mike, I'll update your application. I'll get someone on board that could speak to that. Same thing with you, Lind and Hash. And my goal is to close these out so that way there's nothing hanging for these back and forth questions as we go forward. Thanks for taking the time to come. Thanks for taking the time to flag those. Is there anything else on your mind before we, we set?